So I think there's been a realization that the flexible talent strategy, it's going to be di directly linked to the competitive advantage and to the responsiveness that you can have to address like a, a increasingly fast change environment. The market now is changing and how you build your team and how you need to resource your team is changing. The moment that the constraint of the location is out, people are looking for the skill set that they need to deliver uh, the work rather than when they are. 65% of talent leaders could only plan six months ahead or less. What do you think the future holds? I see that the organizations are already putting into place uh, programs to integrate contractors into their own culture in a way that in the past was not relevant. Hello everyone, this is Hiring All Cylinders and I'm Chris Abbas. Today I'm joined in London with João Martirez, COO of Juno Juno. Hello João. Hello Chris, thank you so much for having me. All the way from Portugal, yes. in London. You brought the weather with you. Well, <laughs> I, well I wish yeah. I wish that was the case, but no. <laughs> I think everyone wishes it was the case too. It had a few good days when I was here, and it lulled me into a false sense of security, and then raining today. Um, we're talking today about something that is on front of mind for a lot of leaders that I'm speaking to at the moment, which is flexible talent strategy and solutions. Yep. Um, and obviously, you guys are at the forefront of that with your contract and management system. So I guess I wanted to start, contractors have always been really important to use in your talent strategy, but I think there's been a move over the last four or five years where it's becoming even more important and people are considering you know, the makeup of their team more and more. What do you think the trends are or the things that have happened in the last you know, four or five years that have led to people considering contractors um, as a bigger part of their strategy? Yep. So um, I, I think like uh, it's uh, it's very a uh, very relevant question and uh, like there are market dynamics that have accelerated these considerations. Mm -hmm. So one of them is like the the usage of more distributed workforces. Mm -hmm. Then uh, there's a massive acceleration on the technology landscape as mm -hmm. well. So like uh, with the uh, companies to become and to continue to co to be innovative, mm -hmm. they need to tap into skills that uh, they don't have today. So I think there's been a realization at the top of the organizations to think that the flexible talent strategy, it's going to be di directly linked to the competitive advantage and to the responsiveness that you can have to address like a, a increasingly fast change environment. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the key things that we hear about flexible talent strategy um, it's uh, around like uh, driving innovation. Mm -hmm. So like uh, looking at the organization, mapping the skills, making decisions, these skill sets, we want to have a permanent team and a core team to do it. Then uh, the other skill sets we have to have it, we want to have it on demand. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I think it's also a big consideration around competitiveness and the responsiveness to market conditions. Mm -hmm. So we have seen over the last years, uh, big economic cycles, cycles that have uh, like uh, moved sideways mm -hmm. in very short amount of time. So it uh, allows flexibility and adaptability to the organization. And I think there's uh, also a very interesting one that's around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Because like uh, using like contractors and expanding the talent pool beyond the permanent, it's actually uh, quite a key consideration that in the previous years, I would say that it was more focused just on permanent hiring. Mm -hmm. I think like uh, organizations now are also expanding diversity, equity, inclusion, and to start to look at uh, the benefits of having uh, a flexible talent strategy that contributes to that by leveraging more contractors. Mm -hmm. And are you seeing that, you know, a lot of the old narrative around building your talent strategy was maybe having, you know, 80-20, which would be 80% FT and then 20% uh, flexible contractors, freelancers, et cetera. Are you seeing that that flexible percentage is increasing over the last few years? Uh, I think so. Uh, like when we, when we are speaking with the, with the talent leaders, HR leaders and other leaders in the organization, there's definitely a consideration there mm -hmm. uh, because like, um, I think like uh, the, the movement and there's a big movement that's related with the skill based organization. So like, the, the biggest organizations are moving uh, from uh, like jobs and family 
to actually mark, map organizations based on skills, mm -hmm. and then uh, to, to also address, for example, new technologies, new innovation. There's uh, a little bit of uncertainty in the future, even on the impact uh, of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, generative AI. So there's, a big, uh, there's some big trends that are bringing some uncertainty and that require also becoming the companies become more responsive. Mm -hmm. So um, we do see that uh, uh, in the market, that 80-20 rule, it's at least being challenged. Mm -hmm. I would say that probably on the largest corporates, it's more considerations. Mm -hmm. But when we look at like mid-size or like challenger companies or disruptive companies, that 80%, 80-20, it's, it's no longer there. Yeah, absolutely. I, I share that experience as well. From speaking to leaders, it's definitely moving to 70, 30, maybe yeah. 60, 40 in some instances. And I think the last four years where there's been COVID and it's meant that companies have had to move up and down. Then there was that big boom in 21, 22, where they had to scramble for talent. It was hyper competitive yeah. and then layoffs again. And I think leaders are understanding that the market now is changing and how you build your team and how you need to resource your team is changing. And that flexibility really is an advantage. Yeah. Um, now, I guess if you're a leader and you're thinking about how to build your, your team and you're interested in, in contractors and building a flexible workforce, what are the key considerations that you think a leader should be thinking about? Talentful provides flexible recruiting solutions to the world's most ambitious companies. Are you thinking about ways to add flexibility to your talent function with recent market volatility and hiring set to return to growth mode in the near future, there's never been a better time to choose the right partner to help you scale. Talentful's embedded sourcing, recruiting, coordination, and talent advisory services have been trusted by the world's leading brands. Companies such as Atlassian, Microsoft, Expedia, Pinterest, Waymo, and more. Whether you're hiring across engineering, go-to-market, or GNA, Talentful has got you covered. To find out how Talentful can help you, visit talentful.com. Yeah, so I think like uh, it starts like uh, with understanding the organizational needs. Mm -hmm. So um, like uh, from a leader perspective, understanding what are the business goals and the skills that you require to achieve them. Then I would always like to uh, say that it's important to understand with that, what's the nature of work as well? Mm -hmm. Because like uh, there's always going to be a consideration, should we have uh, the skills as permanent people mm -hmm. and like more like with the long term, mm -hmm. or are the skills a need that I have today to more for a tactical or even a strategic initiative, but it's going to be more a project based. Mm -hmm. So I would always say that uh, that good understanding of what is required to achieve the business goals, it's going to help. Mm -hmm. And then I think like there's also a consideration around the type of skills that uh, that are required to do that. Because if it's skills that are very niche and that they are going to be uh, probably driving innovation, often due to the opportunity cost of trying to get the permanent hire, you are better off of looking uh, that at, as a contractor basis. Mm -hmm. And um, I think lastly, um, it's quite important uh, for, um, for the leaders to take into consideration the responsiveness to the market mm -hmm. conditions. Mm -hmm. Because like, um, uh, it will allow like, to scale up and down if required the organization just by baking that, uh, so just uh, by bringing contractors mm -hmm. and then having a good understanding of what is the demand that uh, that uh, that they need to respond to. Mm -hmm. So how, you know, when using a platform like Uno Juno, how fast can an organization expect to, you know, scale up a team or get contractors on board? And and, and um, could you talk more about that process? Yeah, yeah, of course. So so like uh, one of uh, one of our key things is that we leverage product and technology to accelerate uh, like um, all the onboarding processes. Mm -hmm. So a, a company that is using uh, like uh, Unujunu typically to onboard the contractor, uh, including like vetting the independent structure, uh, verifying all the documents and having them up and running, mm -hmm. uh, it takes less than two days. Mm. 
Um, and uh, originally what is happening is that like this process is particularly around like uh, uh, the validation of all the documents take normally like one to two weeks depending on who is doing it. Mm -hmm. So there's a piece of like uh, doing uh, and leveraging the speed, uh, leveraging technology to accelerate onboarding. And then the one of the key features that uh, a lot of our clients like is that they can build their internal uh, like almost talent pool. Mm -hmm. So instead of like being managing multiple contractors in multiple places, it brings a centralized view that um, particularly for the known relationships, they will have uh, like in analytics and insights on what they worked, what they have worked, what are their skills, uh, what has been basically the cost, and uh, it spreads that across the organization. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like uh, building your own internal marketplaces mm -hmm. uh, and uh, retaining that information. And once they have been vetted, they, you can just go and book them. Mm -hmm. So after those two days of onboarding, if they are available, they can use like uh, our in-chat function to talk with the contractors, and then mm -hmm. they just it's uh, almost a one click at, at one click of a button to to book those contractors. Awesome. And in terms of the vetting, and do, do you know do you know deal with the vetting? Does the does the company interview the people? How does the process of you know making sure the quality bar is high enough or matches what the company is looking for work? So it it depends normally on uh, on uh, how they are sourcing these candidates. Mm -hmm. So if there's if there's uh, it, if it's their own relationships, sure. normally we assume that the quality uh, has been vetted by them, and then what we do we support them more with the compliance mm -hmm. and with the tax vetting. Sure. Um, then we also support them like to make sure that the role that they are trying to engage with that independent contractor, it's actually a role that uh, it's f f suitable for independent contractor. So right. to avoid any mis misclassification risks mm -hmm. and penalties. Mm -hmm. Then if they use their third party suppliers or if they are even using like a Unijunu marketplace, then we are also vetting the quality and mm -hmm. we then support them. So in our marketplace, we will always vet the quality by looking at work experience, looking at portfolios, requesting references. Mm -hmm. Whenever it's with our third party suppliers, mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the hiring manager or the project manager of the client is the one that will assess the quality of uh, the referrals of their own, own vendors. Makes sense, absolutely makes sense. Um, and you mentioned the, some of the considerations and this is where I think some people get concerned about contracts or maybe don't understand is they think it's really complicated around you know, legal and compliance. And, and it maybe is. But how should people think about that? Can you talk about the considerations on the compliance legal and how yeah. a leader could effectively handle those things? Yeah. So I think like uh, there's two ways to look at that. So yeah. if you do it yourself, yeah. then uh, it's probably going to be more complex because uh, like uh, you will need to take into consideration like uh, multiple local regulations mm -hmm. from tax, from employment, uh, in particular those two. Uh, I would normally say that uh, if you leverage a partner to do that, then it becomes easier because... Uh, the particularly if technology is being used. Mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, for example, what we aim for, it's what we would normally say, making compliance a delightful experience. So um, I think like uh, where we are going towards and heading towards is that uh, companies like you know, Juno and, there are, and the other players, that they understand that this can be a little bit scary and it can be complex. So by building flows into the product that make a seamless experience and a guided experience, then it makes it very, very, very easy. Mm -hmm. Because like uh, then uh, like you can leverage technology to take into account the local considerations. And then from a user experience, uh, it's just almost like using a consumer product mm -hmm. that uh, information is collected when required. And then uh, we leverage like uh, humans and technology to provide an outcome and to provide uh, what would be the result that the end user is interested in, and that is, is this a true independent contractor mm -hmm. or is this a employee engagement? So um, I would say that for certain companies, if they have the internal resources 
to do it internally, it probably makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. If it's not their car and uh, they are not willing to take that risk, there's like a Unijun potentially as a solution mm -hmm. to solve that problem. And so regarding the tax, the compliance, the payroll, all of that stuff, you know, Juno can handle all of that. Yes, yes. It's okay. going to be, it's a end-to-end -end solution in that in that perspective. Okay. That's good to know because, yeah, I think that a lot of companies find the prospect of contracts overwhelming for that reason. So having that kind of taken care of, I think, is um, a good thing for a lot of leaders. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. And like uh, when we are talking with leaders, one of the things that uh, it's highly valuable is standing behind then your technology and your service by providing like uh, an indemnification mm -hmm. that uh, what they get, it's actually we stand behind it. Mm -hmm. So I think like there's a, a lot of companies that um, do they offer the service, but then don't provide that level of peace of mind. Mm -hmm. But um, when uh, when talking with leaders, I think like uh, the, one of the key questions, particularly when uh, it's around the risk of engaging independent contractors, it's uh, it's providing that peace of mind that uh, if something goes wrong, that uh, the service provider is actually standing behind mm -hmm. uh, the full end-to-end -end services. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it definitely takes something off the plate so they can focus on you know, doing their yeah. job. Um, now, in terms of, you mentioned earlier that one of the key trends you were seeing was like distributed workforces. Mm -hmm. And I'm really interested to get your take on this. Are you seeing any trends in the market of certain locations that are really hotting up in terms of talent marketplaces or where people are bringing on board talent. Um, and how has that changed? Because, you know, pre-COVID, it was the main cities, you know, people were in office and they were hiring people in those cities. But now that's changed. So can you maybe see talk about what you're seeing? Yeah, so so it's quite interesting. Like, uh, definitely the remote uh, acceptance, it changed massively. Mm -hmm. So particularly with independent contractors, like we, we saw a shift after COVID, like... Uh, there was a, a almost like I would say at least a misconception or a perception that the independent contractors should be on site. Mm -hmm. That basically now it's uh, it's we see it very very in few cases where they request someone to be on site, mm. um, and then with the remote guy comes like uh, the the skill set. Right, so there's no longer a, a, a location barrier. So what we are seeing is that, particularly for certain skills, we start to see certain pockets in certain uh, uh, locations that uh, are more acceptable. So, for example, in tech, we see a lot of clients, and tech and creative, a lot of clients are using, for example, Poland. Mm. Um, so we see like uh, UK companies that are more willing now to engage with contractors across Europe. Mm -hmm. We see. Uh, for, for example, Portugal, Spain, France coming up more and more. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it, I, but uh, I think like uh, the the key difference is really the remote, right? Because uh, the like uh, the moment that the constraint of the location is out, people are looking for the skill set that they need to deliver uh, the work, mm -hmm. rather than when they are. And the, what we what we are seeing is that uh, even in terms of cost. The, the day rates are getting closer and closer yeah. on a global basis. I was going to ask that question, actually. Like, what is, what's your view on what's going to happen with the competitiveness of these locations? Because you know, a lot of the leaders that I spoke to, their initial purpose for maybe considering other locations was, okay, this isn't going to be as competitive. We can be like a premium uh, employer in this market, and we can also get talent at maybe a fraction of the cost or a little bit cheaper. Do you think that's going to change? I think it's changing already. Yeah, I think like uh, it's it's still not on par, mm. but we definitely are starting to see uh, that uh, the arbitrage, if we would call it, yeah. uh, on uh, like uh, different uh, cost of living in certain countries, it's kind of mm. evening out. And I would say that in certain skills and certain uh, types of contractors, probably it's already evened out. So, for example, in technology. There are certain skill sets, if they are kind of niche or they are very sought for, like it really doesn't matter now mm -hmm. the days where they are. Interesting. Yeah, but, that's. Oh, but overall, uh, even even out, I think the gap the gap is getting uh, yeah. getting uh, shorter. And how do you think employers are thinking about that? Uh, because there's tons of debates that have been happening of, you know, if you have a compensation framework that looks at 
where people are located or you know if you're in london versus manchester the salary bands would be different for example um, and then there's some that say well actually if you're delivering the same work you should be paid the same wherever you are and i think maybe you're seeing that play out in the data you've got are you seeing a certain trend with how companies are thinking about employing people in a distributed way so i think uh, when it comes to contractors uh, probably they are more open mm. to get out of those policies sure. because they are looking for the skills and they are so the, the way that they are budgeting they budget the project mm -hmm. and then if the skills are required to deliver that project they normally like uh, are more flexible there yeah i think uh, in the permanent hiring it's where pro where, where like the 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 challenges will become more and more because like uh, you might have someone for example in portugal working for a u.s company mm -hmm. and uh, if the opportunities start to increase and they are good and there are more u.s companies willing to pay for that permanent person at certain point someone that has like very rigid policies yeah. around distributed workforce might lose a talented mm -hmm. permanent employee. I think with the contractors, because it's always been a very competitive and almost open market, mm -hmm. because they, they they close one project, they move to the next one, they might be working with multiple. There's already more uh, acceptance on the market dynamics mm -hmm. versus the other one. So I don't think, I, so like uh, in, in short, I don't think there's any change or material change in terms of the key considerations there just due to the nature of like, a, it's almost like being an open market for 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 longer. Yeah, that makes t total sense. Um, regarding like technology in general, you know, there's this big AI push and everyone's talking about AI. Um, firstly, I guess it'd be interesting to talk about AI within your product if there is ways you're thinking about AI in, in your product um, itself. But then also, are you seeing an increase in the demand for AI talent in your marketplace or yeah so on, on, on the first point we do see like certain use cases mm -hmm. where we are now like looking to invest so when it's like uh, to support users uh, to do more relevant project descriptions mm -hmm. and that's based on like even previous projects that they've worked uh, just and that's just speed like because like uh, uh, what are the key deliverables what is the the project description all of that, if there's there's been a similar project within the company, but that project manager didn't know, we can see how to harness that data and then to provide uh, a relevant job description. We also see that on the algorithm and on the search, like mm -hmm. to match and to do recommendations then based on that project, go to the marketplace, pick up the skills that have been successfully delivering those projects in the past, and then mm -hmm. recommend people. Yeah. So that's where we see a lot of potential. It's like helping and making it more efficient from the end user, and then they can just add it, and then on the recommendations on matchmaking to increase the likelihood of a project deliver. Then uh, in terms of like uh, companies looking for AI skill sets, we see that um, we see that uh, on the more on the tech sector. Mm -hmm. um, and we start to see also like a, a, a big uplift, but it, I don't, wouldn't say that uh, that it's that uh, material uh, mm. on the other industries yet. Yeah, I mean that would be an incredible experience if you were thinking about building a product. You come to Uno Juno, you put the product description and the project, and then there was ten people recommended yeah. against it. That's, and you that's could just the vision. Get them on board. Um, that seems incredibly simple. Um, and uh, so I, I kind of want to run through like a bit of a case study here of, you know, if I'm a talent leader or I'm a leader in general, I've got a project upcoming, it's for a defined period of time. And I'm thinking, okay, contractors could be a really good way to solve this problem and to build this product. How would I, what would be the steps that I'd go through um, with a platform like yours um, to go from that for process to having people in my business. Like, I think that would be an interesting kind of roadmap to talk through so people could understand it, um, what they would need to do. Yeah, so so I think like uh, if uh, if you have, a, you, um, you have a project uh, description, you come, you just uh, place the, the project, then uh, uh, you can 
if you already have like your known contractors, you can invite them. Mm -hmm. So let's say that you have a project and uh, you already have worked with a few people that you know. Sure. Uh, and uh, you just want to bring them on board, accelerate, then making sure that timesheets or uh, milestones are captured and then pay them. Mm -hmm. You just invite them to the platform. You don't need to do anything else, actually. Right. And then everything uh, is done automatically by the product. Mm -hmm. If you don't know the people mm -hmm. yet, you can just put the brief on the marketplace. Then you can search and you can filter, for example, for the skills that you need for the project. Mm -hmm. Or uh, today, you can also like leverage our talent team uh, so that they can support you mm -hmm. by making like recommendations. Right. So. Those are really the steps that you would need. Then all the compliance, all of the payments, invoicing, that mm -hmm. it's taken away from you. Yeah. And it's done by the product or by the by the Unijuru team. Awesome. And if I have a mixture, so I know a few people, but I need a few extra and I don't know them, I can do yes, both. Yes, you can do both. Right. And so if I'm a, a hiring manager that's got some time, I want to lead it, I can search through the people myself, I can interview them myself. But if I'm not focused on it, there's someone who can help me in, in the business and you can bring the candidates yes, to Yes, correct. Me. Correct. Cool. And, um, and uh, you can even, so it's one actually one feature that we, we build that uh, uh, it's quite loved uh, by, by the hiring managers and project managers is like building like dynamic talent pools mm. that uh, you can like, let's say that you know that uh, you have a project coming in one or two months and uh, you want already to start to build a pool of talent. You can build that pool of talent with your known relationships, with the people that are in our marketplace, mm -hmm. with people that uh, might be referred to you by your talent partners. You can build there, and when the time is mm -hmm. done, you can you can invite them. You can check their availabilities, and then you just uh, just go into the into the execution mode. Mm. That's cool. Yeah, so that's like, a, that's quite a, quite an interesting. <laughs> yeah, one. I wish most people were as um, planned and prepared as that. <laughs> I feel like a lot of people aren't. Well, some of them, they, yes, yeah. yes, it's used, it's used, <laughs> but uh, probably not as the adoption that <laughs> yeah. you would like people to have it. Yeah, but it's a great idea. We actually, um, I think, because of the volatility recently, I think this actually leans into the the, the use for contractors. Is we did a, a survey recently that showed that. 65% of talent leaders could only plan um, six months ahead or less. Mm. And I think that this is a real use case for using contractors because um, you know, if you can only see that far ahead, it doesn't make sense to hire yeah, teams, and, and right? The, and even the time to hire, it's yeah. not going to fit because certain roles, yeah. you hire them, by the time that you onboard them, six months are gone. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it really doesn't make sense. Um, so I do think that flexible um, workforces are going to be a really big thing. And you're seeing this move to fractional talent as well. They're calling it fractional talent. Um, I know tons of people who've taken that step. So that I think the quality of candidates and the talent pool that you have access to now is getting bigger and bigger uh, for contractors, which is really f interesting. Regarding the, the, the talent that you um, provide, is it Full time, five days a week. Is it part? Can you get one, two days a week? Like, how does that work? So we see a mix. Mm -hmm. So you, we, we see that, uh, for example, if uh, we have actually a mix of everything. So mm -hmm. like, uh, there might be someone that has a project that requires for X many weeks, someone that's working five days. Mm -hmm. That happens. We also have uh, a lot of projects that uh, it's like uh, really like two, three days a week, mm -hmm. a few hours. Okay. So it, it really ranges. Uh, in the um, in the tech industry, we tend to see l longer term yeah. projects. Mm -hmm. When it comes to creative marketing or even sometimes even product management, it uh, sometimes it can range like for a long term or just can be just a few hours or right. one or two days. So access to the whole spectrum there. Yes, the, yes, the and, the, and the, sometimes we see contractors they are working with uh, well two three clients at the same yeah. time as well. So um, so they kind of that fractional movement. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's quite clear on the on the on the when we look at the client per contractor at any given time. You you can see that. Awesome. Um, so you know it's clear that there's a trend happening right now. If you were to get your crystal ball and um, predict what's going to happen in the future and where the market is going in regards to you know, flexible talent. What do you think the future holds? So I think like uh, the, the, in the future it will increase. So like uh, 
the I, I'm speaking a lot with a lot of leaders at the moment, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of the questions and the considerations are like forward looking, and it's all around the skill based organization. Mm -hmm. And then the consideration and uh, what the leaders are seeing is that okay, we need to actually have two movements or two main drivers one is the core and the permanent, and the other one it's going to be the flexible talent slash contractors. Mm -hmm. And then on the flexible talent contractors, their concerns is that uh, does it make sense even in the future to have a big portion of people that are permanent? Because like the technology and particularly with AI uh, accelerated a big change that I would say that it's unclear what's going to be the impact. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, the, what we are seeing is that uh, the requirement of specific skills very likely will increase mm. and the, the working ways will change. Yeah. So I think like uh, what I believe it's going to be in the future is that definitely that percentage, even now that might be on the 30, 40% of contingent, probably it's going to accelerate enough, even further. Mm -hmm. And um, I see that the organizations are already putting into place uh, programs to integrate contractors into their own culture mm -hmm. in a way that in the past was not relevant. So um, I believe it's uh, it's going to be a, a, a there the, like the use of contracts is going to accelerate even further in the future. Wow. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up. Um, before we wrap up, where can people find you? How can they get in touch? So uh, to find me, like just uh, we have our own website, so unujuno.com, and uh, like uh, we we are always reachable. Yeah, awesome. Well, yeah. thank you very much, Al. Um and thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the conversation, please don't forget to follow and subscribe for future episodes. Thank you. Mm -hmm.